time is of the essence is not just a phrase. It is a contractual agreement, and it comes directly from the business contracts. It means if one party fails to complete the contract performance within the specified time in the contract, the other party has the right to sue for breach of contract. This is especially true in the construction industry. Welcome to Construction Scheduling, presented by Tech Training, LLC. This scheduling introduction will be presented in four parts. First, we'll review some historical milestones in scheduling. Next, we are going to create the network schedule. This will include what is commonly referred to as the forward pass and backward pass. The network schedule will also give us our free float, total float, and lag time. This information becomes critical when making decisions on the job site. Then we will review resource leveling. This is a technique used when resources, for one reason or the other, become limited. And we will finish this presentation by crashing the schedule. This is a common process used when project times need to be accelerated. So, let's get started with a historical review of scheduling milestones. Planning can be considered the what of what is to be done. We can also consider how, where, and who will be performing these functions. Of course, the piece of information that is not provided in planning is when. Owners want their projects completed on time and within budget, and very early on, innovators were beginning to analyze data. History shows that William Playfair, born 1759, died 1823, was a man of many talents, some questionable, but he is also credited with creating the very first bar chart. His bar chart first appeared in his Commercial and Political Atlas, published in 1786. According to Benninger and Robin, 1978, Playfair was driven to this invention by a lack of data. In his atlas, he had collected a series of 34 plates about the import and export from different countries over the years. He presented them as line graphs for surface charts. However, it is worth mentioning, two decades before Playfair's bar chart, Joseph Priestley, born 1733, died 1804, had created an innovative timeline chart in which individual bars were used to visualize the lifespan of a person, and the whole could be used to compare the spans of multiple persons. Regardless of these early innovations, management of time and cost did not become a science until after the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution began in England in about 1760 and ended around 1840. During this period, many industries changed, most notably the textile and construction industries. The construction industry changed dramatically in England as John McAdam began to construct turnpikes or roads on which goods could travel. These became known as McAdam Roads. The first McAdam Road in the U.S. was laid on the Boonesboro Turnpike, Maryland, in 1822. The turnpike ran from Boonesboro to Hagerstown. Now, with faster travel times, merchants began to connect the relationship of time and money. However, it wasn't until much later that time and money became a science. One of the early innovators of time and cost management was Henry Gant. Gant was an American mechanical engineer and management consultant who is best known for his work in the development of scientific management. He created the Gantt chart in the 1910s. Though early Gantt charts did not show task dependencies, it did indicate anticipated production times and deadline dates for projects. 
Gantt charts were used by the military in World War I and even on the Hoover Dam. The next big development in scheduling came in the 1950s. In about 1956 or 1957, James Kelly Jr. of Remington Rand and Morgan Walker of DuPont developed algorithms for what is known as the Arrow Diagramming Method, or ADM, of project management. This is the forerunner or foundation of what is known today as the Critical Path Method, or CPM. At about the same time, the U.S. Navy created what is known as the Program Evaluation Review Technique, or PERT, PERT. PERT was slightly different from ADM, as PERT considered probabilities. In other words, PERT took into consideration what-ifs. In the 1980s, PCs came along. This led to a large number of various scheduling systems. These systems were putting together the ADM and CPM methods while incorporating the what-ifs. The predominant software for construction scheduling was introduced by Primavera. Primavera was founded by three gentlemen, Dick Ferris, Joel Kopelman, and Les Seskin. Primavera is still a leading construction scheduling company. And this leads us back to planning and scheduling. Planning of a construction project does relate to developing the logic of how a project will be completed. Scheduling consists of integrating that plan with a calendar or a specific time frame. For construction, we identify and describe all of the separate tasks that are going to be completed. We are also going to sequence the tasks logically. Once this is completed, the scheduling can be done. Scheduling consists of determining task durations. It is also going to include the overall duration of the project. Putting each task into context and understanding the length of time for individual tasks is going to be crucial in our overall schedule. So, let's take a look at some scheduling techniques. We have already discussed a little bit about the Gantt chart, but early on, Henry Gantt develops this system. It looks like this, and it's considered very effective. Essentially, we are drawing bars or activities onto the charts. Then, a timeline is written across the top and the bottom of the chart. Each activity has a bar which is drawn from the beginning of the activity to the end. The Gantt chart is still used today for many industries and has gone through some major changes since Henry created it over 100 years ago. The biggest advantage of the Gantt chart is that they are easily prepared and present the time scale of the project. These charts are used often, whether you are in the construction industry or not. When you look at this chart, it is easily identifiable as to where the project is. Gantt charts are simple. They show when major activities are going to begin and when they are going to end, but only as it relates to time. These charts did lose their appeal in construction early on. It was because as the project became more complex, these charts did not show the dependency that one activity had on the other. In other words, if one activity was delayed, future activities were not moved down the timeline. But most of these disadvantages have been addressed in many of the current software packages that use Gantt charts. Network schedules became the favorite of the construction industry, especially on larger projects. The network schedule is considered a CPM model. Using the critical path method, each task is assigned a specific duration. That duration allows the construction manager to create calculations which will run throughout the entire network of tasks. This provides the manager with a specific duration for the entire project. These calculations produce an algorithm. These algorithms give the construction manager the earliest a project is expected to be completed, 
the earliest any activity can begin, the latest any activity can begin, and the impact of any delays on the project. Now, depending upon the project, there are other types of scheduling systems as well, most notably a matrix schedule. A matrix schedule is almost like a spreadsheet, where it shows all of the activities listed for a particular project. This type of schedule is often used where a project has similar activities throughout, such an example, housing. This type of schedule has a big benefit in the fact that by listing the same activities for each project, no activities will be missed. This allows the contractor or developer to show all the units being built in a single schedule. This is a shot of a matrix schedule. It shows that there is nothing graphical about a matrix schedule. That is because activities are very similar from one project to the next and therefore it is not necessary to include what might be considered minor details. But the schedule is handy as you can mark notes directly onto the schedule or mark them into a cell associated with a particular activity. A schedule system that may show even less detail is called the horse blanket scheduling system. We see an example of the horse blanket schedule here, and it is very graphical. That is because it shows relative levels of effort or time that is going to be committed to particular stages of the project as the project evolves. A good example where this might be used is on an infrastructure project where two miles of roadway may be contracted to a particular contractor, and it is listed in the horse blanket schedule simply as two miles of roadway, done by G.C. Jones. The next phase of the schedule might say bridge over 495, done by G.C. Smith. This type of schedule is letting the CM know which contractor will be completing which work and how much time they have to do it. But there is an assumption that the GC knows what they are doing and will get it done on time. So, now let's talk a little bit about the nitty-gritty. When using any of these schedules, it is logical for a constructor to think A to Z. It makes sense. It's logical. It's easy to follow. And it's also a mistake. Most construction projects will consist of a lot more than a single task, and even when working on a single task, there are other tasks that can be running concurrently. Therefore, if we try to make a single task out of framing, what might be some of the smaller tasks that we leave out? The schedule must be completed without leaving out any major or minor tasks. The best way to guarantee that nothing is left out is to ensure that the preparation of the schedule is done in a systematic manner. One of the most common ways to develop these tasks without missing the details is by using a work breakdown structure, WBS. The work breakdown structure is a system that describes the various components of the project schedule. As an example, in a typical building, the WBS would contain such systems as the site work, structure, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, etc. A work breakdown structure begins with the major components of the tasks that need to be done. Then each system is broken down into greater and greater detail. As an example, let's take a look at site work. The breakdown of site work may include drainage, grading, paving, landscaping, and so on. So the work breakdown structure identifies all of the activities that need to be done within a particular task. But it is important to note that the work breakdown structure is not a schedule. It is a tool to formulate the schedule and depending upon the size of the project and the project complexity, the WBS may be large or small. As Aristotle said, well begun is half done. The reality is we must prepare our activities before we can create a schedule. One of the most important things about the network schedule is the actual development of it. 
There are many ways to develop a schedule, but much depends on the experience of the people preparing it and the people who will be using it. So, one of the first things we do is define the activities. Anything that has to be accomplished by anyone is considered an activity. So let's start by looking at a production and or construction. These would be activities that are directly related to creating the actual facility. These are activities that are easily understood by everybody on the construction site, such items as building a foundation, framing, and such. Here we still have to be careful. Let's consider an item such as placing concrete. The concrete placement itself may only take one day, but time is of the essence. Can we use the concrete the next day to set up equipment on? Absolutely not. Concrete needs to develop strength. Therefore, we must consider the most important resource when creating a schedule is in fact time. The next item is procurement. Procurement means getting the materials, the money, the equipment, the workforce, and all the other items necessary to construct the project. Though this may seem simple, you have to consider long lead items, the availability at the local level for the workforce. What about the availability of materials in the area? These items will have an impact on the schedule and the development of the schedule. Next is management. Support staff and administrative staff directly impact the project schedule. These tasks are not extra tasks and therefore have to be considered when creating a network schedule. Tasks such as preparing inspections, processing shop drawings, processing approvals, tracking funds, submittals all take time. When developing the model, a variety of issues must be considered, so think about the objective of the schedule. A schedule should be created as a management tool in the field. To do this, we must be clear about the activities. More specifically, which activities follow a particular activity and which activity precedes a particular activity, and just as important, which activities can be done at the same time? These questions can all be answered by what is referred to as a precedent diagramming. This is often referred to as an IPA or simply looking at every activity's immediate preceding activity. But putting activities in order is not as easy as it may seem. The reason two activities must be done in a particular order is referred to as a constraint. Even though that sounds painful, the reality is without constraints all activities could theoretically begin at the same time, and we know this is not possible. The duration of a construction project is contractually constrained by the length of the specified time in the contract documents. Consider some of these constraints. Physical, perhaps a small site with no laydown or storage space. Environmental, working near wetlands or other protected areas. Resource restrictions such as cash or labor. Managerial restrictions, your supervisors can only be in so many places at once. And productivity, consider your productivity rates on a beautiful April day compared to a miserable mid-January day. These are all constraints which may in fact lead to other constraints. Therefore, you may encounter time and contractual restraints, safety restrictions, productivity restrictions, financial restrictions, and regulatory restrictions. These restrictions have to be reckoned with when creating your activity durations and developing the schedule logic. The best way to avoid confusing network logic is the precedent diagramming method. In fact, the most popular software programs in use today use the precedent diagramming method. Years ago, in the 60s and 70s, there was a considerable amount in the use of arrow diagrams. But such diagrams are rarely used today. 
The big advantage of the precedent diagram method is it uses nodes in conjunction with arrows and lines. The use of nodes allows the schedule to show dependencies of one activity to another. It shows the required previous task that must be accomplished before an activity can begin. This is a simple precedent diagram. Here you see that activity A must be completed before activities B or C. However, we also see activities B and C can be accomplished simultaneously. Once activity B is complete, activities D and E can be completed, again simultaneously. But it is important to note that each of these activities take time and there is a logical link between each activity. And now we're ready to move on to part two and create our network schedule.